Hi everyone and welcome. I'm down here in my wormery and I'm preparing to set up a couple new worm bins. So I've laid out all the things that I would need to do this and I figured I would just prop up the camera a little bit higher and set it to wide angle to show more than usual and just really quickly go through what I'm preparing to do here since everything's out already and um, even though I'm going to be building two bins today I figured I could just walk through the creation of one bin together with you the viewers and um, and then naturally if you've got any questions please put them down in the comments but this is just meant to be a, a kind of a high level overview sort of putting things into their own respective categories and even though I might not have examples of every possible option I will try to mention some of those things that aren't on display here so over here on my right I've got a couple bins these are the two bins that I've got set up for being built up as bins today and one of them is a uh, it's a bag system the bag systems have the benefit of being a fabric material that allows for good airflow which is always beneficial to your composting setup for the worms and this bag has already once been used before and originally this bag was designed to either um, rest inside of a frame or sit inside of a tote but the container that I'm using here is not a tote it's similar to a tote a little bit smaller though it's what's known as a bus box or a bus bin it's the um, it's the box that you see when they come around to your table at the restaurant and clean off all the dirty dishes and um, they're relatively inexpensive and the one thing I like about these is that they're a little bit smaller than those larger size totes that a lot of people use because um, believe it or not um, a tub like this filled up with castings has a significant amount of weight so I prefer to try to keep the weight down to keep things easy to handle easy to manage uh, so this is one of the systems that I'm going to be setting up today but I want to show another possibility here in case you're uh, inclined to follow that uh, route is the uh, is the option to have your container be just a complete solid container which is what most people do and there's always the option to either have perforations and holes on the bottom of your container or not and um, when I first started out I was usually setting up my systems this way where the um, the worms were set up with the habitat on top with a, a container that has holes that allow for drainage and then there'd be a, a container on the bottom that would collect any drainage that would go through and as a beginner I was always a little bit um, uncertain about whether I was putting in too much moisture and this was a pretty good little uh, solution to help avoid uh, over dampening your bins even though the worms definitely like a nice damp bin uh, you don't want to go overboard you don't have standing water in your bin uh, as a general rule so having a container that has drainage like this offers its benefits but in my particular case I keep all of my bins on a shelf that's just railings and if uh, you know stuff starts dripping out or material starts um, falling through then it starts to make mess on the lower shelves so I've kind of graduated away from using bins that are perforated with holes and I've um, kind of ended up using bins that in general or just a, uh, a simple container with no holes in it and then I, uh, I, just take, I just take the necessary precautions to make sure that I've not uh, added too much moisture just to make sure things don't get exceedingly damp in my bins so there's so many other types of containers um, all the way back there in the corner for example there's a, uh, uh, a container which is actually a pretty large size bag and it's no, known as a flow through system where you just keep stacking in more and more stuff to be composted by your worms and ideally the worms will make their way to the upper levels of that container and then the container has a little bit of a hatch on the bottom where the material can just be dumped out the bottom hopefully not ejecting the entire contents of the bag um, but allowing you to sort of harvest the finished castings from the bottom never having to completely empty the system out so uh, that's a system that's very popular nowadays a lot of people use it that's also made of a fabric to allow for good airflow so it has that benefit as well um, but I think for the demonstration I'm going to be using this container right here but before we begin I'm just going to go through the rest of the stuff I've got laid out here to show uh, what kind of stuff we can use because um, once you get to building your bin the important materials are in a couple high level categories and one of the categories perhaps the most important one is your bedding and a lot of people will take uh, shredded newspaper they might take uh, 
popular item that uh, I like to use is leaves. And the bottom line is, this doesn't only serve the purpose of bedding. It also doubles as food because eventually this will all be consumed by the worms too. So when the worms diet, the bedding material typically makes up the carbon aspect of the diet. So a balanced diet for a worm consists of nitrogen rich materials, which are typically your kitchen scraps and whatever it is that you're putting in there that has recently been uh, picked or, or hasn't completely dried out yet. And when it comes to the carbon sources, that's where you usually find that um, in your bedding. And uh, I've already shown a couple examples here in newspaper, but there, some people have um, plenty of paper bags on hand. Something that piles up here in my house is uh, coffee filters, and I always try to rinse them off and set them aside. Another thing that I like to set aside are the, uh, the tubes for your paper towel or your toilet paper. And I've got them all hacked up into small pieces here. And um, I guess the other example I've got here for bedding material example is hacked up cardboard. So I think for this um, example, I'll probably be using mainly leaves, cardboard, and some of these tubes, maybe a little bit of paper. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's a real strict requirement for building your bin. But when it comes to this stuff, in most cases, it's fairly dry in the... Uh, the next important aspect is um, maybe easy to overlook, but it's the moisture. So I've got a little bottle of water here on hand, and as I add these layers, I'm going to just spray them down to make sure they're nice and damp. The other option is to simply have a, a bucket of water nearby and soak all these materials in that water, and then maybe wring it out and then add it to your bin. However you moisten your materials, it's up to you, but I'm opting for applying the water using this spray bottle here. And um, working our way over to this side of the table, we, uh, we get to the food. And the food items that I've put here are only a couple different things. It could be any, pretty much anything. But, um, you know, one thing I like to try to do away with when I'm feeding my worms is all of the coffee grinds that add up around here. If you see this many coffee filters, you're going to know there's going to be a lot of used coffee around as well. And then for this, um, for this setup, I've just pulled a few things out of my freezer. I like to store my food for the worms in my freezer because the nice thing about that is that once this stuff starts to thaw out, it, um, it really becomes nice and soft and mushy. So if you were to just take some of these things freshly cut after you've served the food and these are your cuttings or, or leftovers or whatever the case may be, um, they might not break down so readily as if they had been frozen first and allowed to thaw. Uh, people also say that freezing the material also sort of ruptures the cell walls, which uh, also might contribute to um, softening the materials enough and getting them to have a little bit of a jump start for um, being broken down by the worms. So besides this cantaloupe melon that I've gotten here, really just the rinds of the cantaloupe melon. You can also see I've got a little bag of greens in here. These are really... Uh, just the leaves of some radishes. You know, when you buy radishes or carrots or whatever in a bunch, a lot of times you've got the leaves that come along with the vegetables that you've just purchased. So instead of throwing this stuff in the trash, I always like to set it aside to give it to my worms. So we're almost near the end here, but there's a couple more important things that I want to mention, and um, that's right here, which is the next item that I wanted to talk about, which is, in my case, pulverized eggshell. And Pulverized eggshell is a little bit dangerous because um, it's an extremely, extremely coarse material when it gets ground up like this. And you might even be able to see it is that uh, me shaking it around allows some of it to get airborne. And it's stuff that you don't want to breathe in. If you get that into your lungs, it, it's uh, extremely coarse material and it can cause damage. So the one thing you'll always hear people saying about using crushed eggshells as your grit in your worm bins is to be careful not to breathe it in while you're handling it. So I always try to be really careful when it comes to using this and spreading it right over the material so I'm not uh, allowing a great deal of it to become airborne, potentially causing a health risk. I've seen people actually wear a mask when they apply their crushed eggshells too. That's another precautionary measure you can take as well. And um, the arrangement of these things isn't so important either. It's uh, just whatever your personal preference is. So when we get around to demonstrating it, it's not so important how it's done. It's just creating a nice, moist bedding environment, maybe some food items, and then um, 
giving the whole bin some other sort of protection on top so that it doesn't uh, evaporate and dry out too quickly. And that leads us to what I've got all the way out here on the edge. And I've got a couple different examples of things I've seen people use because um, one thing that a lot of people use naturally is if you're using a tote, you might have a lid that came with your container. With these bus boxes, I don't have lids. So um, when I feel that I need to try to retain moisture in my containers, I might, um, I might apply a sheet of plastic right over the top. Some people have leftover bubble wrap from packaging materials that have come to them through mail order. Sometimes you just have shopping bags, vegetable bags, produce bags. It doesn't really matter. The, the function of the plastic covering things is just to not allow moisture to evaporate out of your bin. Especially in the beginning, you know, because once you've got a bin that's fairly mature, lots of finished castings in there which do a wonderful job for retaining moisture and not allowing the moisture to escape so readily. When you're starting out with a fresh new bin, it's, um, it's not very densely packed, it allows for a lot of airflow, but that also allows for a lot of the moisture to readily escape too. So um, one thing I like to do a lot of times is maybe not apply the plastic right down onto the material in my bin. Maybe I'll just use a sheet of newspaper to cover up everything and then place the plastic on, which really allows that newspaper right beneath the plastic to become the landing pad for a lot of the moisture that's attempting to evaporate. It condenses drops back down and the worms really love that. They always like to go hang, in, hang out on that uh, section right below the plastic. In my case, usually right there on the newspaper covering the material in my bin because of the high level of moisture that is there. And then um, a lot of times, once I've got the plastic on there, I also like to uh, just take a piece of cardboard, any sort of piece of cardboard, sort of cut to fit, just to add a little bit of weight and to hold things down within my bin. So that's kind of where I stand. I'm not sure which of these items I'm really going to end up using, so I'm going to kind of wing it when I get around to doing it. But I'm going to bring the camera in a little bit closer, put a bin out here, make some space, and I'm going to get to building a bin just for a quick demonstration. So now that I'm all set to go and I've got my bin that I'm going to be using here in front of me, as well as all the materials and supplies that I'm going to need to build the bin, um, it occurred to me that there was one last item that I had overlooked. And it's a fairly important item as well. And it's the uh, material that a lot of people refer to as an inoculant. And by inoculant, it's, um, it's attempting to introduce into the bin the beneficial microbes and the fungi and some of those types of um, microscopic composters that work hand in hand with the worms to break down all the materials in the bin. And if you happen to have some finished vermicompost like I do from some previous finished worm bins that I've already harvested, then you might already have a collection of compost that you could use as an inoculant in your bin. However, if you're starting your very first worm bin ever and have never had one before and you don't have any vermicompost on hand to inoculate your bin, another easy option is just to go out into your uh, yard and pick up some dirt off the ground. And um, whether you have a garden or just a patch of dirt where you can, you know, uh, not do too much damage to your lawn, but maybe a place where you can go under a bush or someplace where the dirt is readily exposed and scoop some material up off the ground. Just any old plain dirt should do, should work just fine um, as an inoculant in your bin as well. I know a lot of people don't use this and it may, might not be so, so important, but it certainly doesn't hurt, that's for sure. So we will be using a little bit of my finished castings from a compost um, as our inoculant to get this bin started. So now in the past I've demonstrated the build of a bin immediately before putting the worms right in, which really means that the bin would not have really had a chance to benefit from the inoculant, from um, having a little bit of time in advance of the worms being introduced for the materials to start getting broken down and partially uh, to that stage where the worms can really take advantage of it. So it's really a matter of whether or not you've got some lead time before your worms are coming into your possession. If you've got a chance to build your bin ahead of time, then I always recommend that for sure. And I try to do that myself as well. As I try to set up the bin, and I just let it sit. And it doesn't matter how long. If it uh, sits for weeks, months, it doesn't matter. The longer the better as far as I'm concerned. So that once the worms do get put in there, and everything's got like a consistent moisture level throughout the bin, 
Uh, if there was inoculant added already, then that too might have already started the breakdown process of any of the materials that are in the bin, making it all that much easier for the worms to take advantage of all that material once they're introduced. So let's start building this thing. What I've been using lately to start my bins is uh, these tubes. And I like the tubes because they, um, they kind of create pockets of air around them. Uh, they don't stack up so easily, they don't mat up against one another. And whether they lay down this way or this way or whatever, I always feel like I'm ending up with a nice foundation for my bin. One that uh, allows for nice airflow, some good material that the worms can come and go through easily. Um, but when you do it this way, you can see there's all kinds of little voids and holes and stuff. So the next thing I like to do personally going on top of this is add leaves, but let's not forget the importance of moisture. So this stuff is all very dry. So along the way, I'm just gonna periodically go in here and try to moisten any of these really dry materials. Like I said earlier, you might have a bucket. You might have some water that you can dip your ingredients into and moisten them that way before placing them in here. So now I can drop in my next ingredient, in my case, it's going to be leaves. And I, I like the leaves because they're going to kind of fill in a lot of those voids. And I've also found that of my bedding materials, the worms really do seem to favor leaves almost the best. And it kind of makes sense. They've been, you know, evolving for millions of years to break down materials, but one of the main materials that they break down, the stuff that's all over the forest floor on a regular basis, is leaves. So um, this might be your opportunity also, if you collect your leaves the way I do, which is using a vac type machine, you might be bringing along little sticks and stems and stuff that may or may not break down in the time it takes for a bin to get from start to finish. So sometimes I try to, you know, either break pieces of material like this down into smaller bits or simply remove them if I think that they're just going to take way too long to break down. Might not be a practical item to put into your worm bin. But uh, let's make sure we apply some more moisture here. In the case of the leaves, I do think applying the water this way makes a lot more sense because if you start trying to take handfuls of leaves and dipping them in water and moving them around, you're going to have leaves all over the place. You're going to have a big mess. So this to me just seems like a slightly neater and uh, more controlled way to apply these materials. Now I do have a piece of newspaper here. It's only a small fragment of a piece of newspaper. But if you're going to be using newspaper and you don't have a shredder, a lot of people use shredders to take their carbon-based bedding type materials. They might take a whole stack of old um, junk mail or old paperwork from the office that's no longer needed and run it through their shredder and they'll have buckets and buckets full of nice tiny fragments of paper that they could throw into their bins as bedding. But if um, you don't have any anything like that, like a shredder, then you might want to do what you um, did in your arts and crafts class in school when you were a kid, which is simply strip, strip up the paper by hand, like if you were making paper mache. But the trick to tearing paper so that it doesn't go all over the place is to always tear it um, top to bottom. So whatever direction it is that the writing is in, if there's the top of the page and the bottom of the page, the paper is typically of a grain that allows for it to be torn from top to bottom. So if you start a certain width tear at the top and you go down, you don't have to do a whole lot to get an almost perfectly equal strip of paper. And if you go with fairly small little chunks at a time, sometimes it'll not go straight to the bottom. It'll deviate and run off the edge and tear. And sometimes you don't get perfect um, pieces either. But you can kind of control that a little bit too as you tear. And once you do, you get a little bit of practice. You get a you can come up with a technique that really works nicely. So, you know, here again, whether newspaper is something you even have around your house anymore, a lot of people get their news from the television or from the internet, but some people still do um, get newspaper and different types of paper sources coming into their house, whether it's in the form of junk mail or whatever it may be. Uh, if you're using newspaper, then it's always 
useful to know that there is a trick to tearing it in a way that you get nice uh, controlled tears. If you try to tear the other direction, it's uh, fairly difficult to get it in a straight line, as you can see here. <laughs> um, but since I've got so much other material here that I, I want to try to get rid of here, it's usually uh, a matter of what it is that's sort of um, becoming a surplus and that you need to do away with. So that often drives what I'm choosing to use as my materials in my bins. And in my case, um, stuff like coffee filters often pile up. So why don't we throw a coffee filter or two in here as well? I guess in this case, I'm going to just lay them down flat. You know, I mean, sometimes I'll tear them up. Sometimes I'll, uh, you know, try to see if I could figure out what direction the grain goes. But a lot of times with something that's round in shape and there's no top or bottom, it's not quite as easy to figure out what direction the grain of that particular paper is. But it doesn't really matter so much. The worms are not picky, that's for sure. Let's add some more water. I guess the one trick to this too is um, try not to go overboard on the water because you don't want to end up with standing water if you can't avoid it. And uh, you know, unless you're actually wetting the material and having an opportunity to wring it out and make sure that it's not overly damp when you're putting it in. If you're putting the water in like this alongside the materials, you do kind of run the risk of potentially adding a little bit too much. So you want to be careful and you don't want to go overboard. So I've got some other materials here. I've got some cardboard chunks too that we've not yet applied. But I wanted to do this in a little bit of a layered fashion. So now that we've got kind of a nice lower bottom layer in this bin, which consists at this point of um, cardboard tube material that's been chopped up, some leaves, and some newspaper and some coffee filters. We've actually got four different types of carbon materials in here already as um, a sort of a basis for this bin. I thought that um, now we can move on to the next element, which is the food. And you know, when I build my bins, I'm often obtaining my worms out of another active worm bin. And when I try to get my worms to come to a single spot, uh, I'll feed heavily in one place. And when I go in there to scoop the worms out, very often I'm bringing a lot of food material with the worms. So I do anticipate when time comes to put worms into this bin, I will be bringing them along with some food materials. But nevertheless, I like to always also include a little bit of food material in my bins when I'm building them, just to scatter it around lightly in an intermediate layer within the bin and then I'll also try to cover that up eventually so that it is submerged under the surface. So I'm just going to grab a few of these items that I've um, got down here for food for the worms. I've got some yummy cantaloupe rinds which I'm sure they're going to appreciate. And then we'll also grab a handful of these leaves which were also frozen. And I guess, you know, I wanted to use leaves here as an example too, because the leaves that are all dried out, the ones that have already, um, you know, dried, fallen off the tree, had time to sit in your yard and become brown like this, these are a good source of carbon. But if you've got stuff like this that is still fresh from the market, you might have just chopped off the radishes or the carrots, and these are just the leaves that came along with them, this would actually still have a fair bit of nitrogen in it. So, um, you know, there again, it's where the leaf is in terms of being young or being old, being dried out or not, if you can kind of judge that as um, whether or not the material has nitrogen in it or carbon in it. But now we're starting to supplement the carbon only construction of this bin with some foods now, with some nitrogen content as well. And um, another thing that I'll put in here, right on top of the food, is let's not forget the grit. Because the important thing about the grit is that worms don't have stomachs like you and I have. Our stomachs use acid to break the foods we eat down, but, but the stomach of a worm is a little bit different. In fact, it's not even known as a stomach. They call it a gizzard. You might have heard the word before because birds also have gizzards instead of stomachs. And in order for a, an animal to... Uh, consume the food that they're eating using their gizzard. The gizzard is a muscular organ which not only um, brings the food in but it also brings in the 
the grit that you're giving them as well, or the grit they consume as well. And that's why chickens often pick up little pebbles and eat pebbles and little rocks, because they do need uh, grit in their gizzards, so that within the gizzards, the muscle organ grinds the food and the grit together, and in that fashion, break it down. Instead of chemically, they actually break it down mechanically. So that's biology lesson 101 about how worms and birds and other animals with gizzards digest their foods. But before we wrap up here, another food item that I often like to use is my used coffee. So if you've ever been on my channel before and watched any of my videos, you'll see that nine times out of 10, I am including coffee in my feedings because the stuff piles up. And I've often got a couple of these containers sitting around up in the kitchen, ready to go at any time to feed my worm bins. So my, bin, my bins are very often fed with coffee which is also, um, you know, despite its brown color, is also a ni uh, nitrogen source. In fact, a very rich nitrogen source. If you're into composting, then you'll know that people refer to the browns, the carbon sources, as browns in your composting mix. And they'll refer to the nitrogen sources in the composting mix as the greens. So even though coffee is obviously brown, from a composting perspective, it classifies as a green. So. That's just another quick FYI in terms of the expressions used in composting. So actually, we're getting pretty close now. You know, now that we've added a number of layers, we're um, you know we're probably almost an inch thick into this bin, but we're not done yet because the next thing that I want to include right there on top of the food is going to be the material that I bought here as my inoculant. And you'll remember I mentioned this earlier before we started building the bin. In my case, I'm using finished worm compost, vermicompost, that I took out of one of my completed worm bins as my inoculant, knowing that it's chock full of all different types of beneficial bacteria and all those tiny microorganisms that are really going to get this bin off to a great start. But if you don't have that, like I said earlier, you could just use some soil from outside and that should work just as well too. For me, it was just convenient to just turn around and grab some vermicompost out of one of my storage buckets. For you, if you don't have any, just as easy to go out in your yard and fetch a little bit of soil right from the ground. So now the one thing I know for sure is that as those chunks of watermelon and these leaves that were all in the freezer begin to thaw out, they are going to emit a fair bit of moisture. So while they seem relatively dry when they're still frozen and they're still in your hand, they, um, they will start to contribute a fair bit of moisture to your bin as well. So I'm not going to add moisture to this particular level that we just added because I know that it already has a pretty good moisture content. Even the, um, the used coffee still has a fair bit of the moisture that it held from when it was still in the coffee machine. So I'm not too worried about moisture at this level. But we're not done using the moisture so we will be back to adding more water momentarily. But before we can consider this bin done I just want to go a little bit further adding a little bit more bedding with which we can actually cover up the feeding layer that we've just applied. So this is where I'm going to bring in my uh, my chopped up cardboard bits. You can see that the pieces are nice and small. And no, I don't have a shredder that can chop up cardboard this small. This was all chopped up by hand, so this was a little bit labor intensive. But I figured why not just go for it. And you might have also noticed another thing worth mentioning is the um, the fact that the newspaper that I was demonstrating with earlier, the piece that I was um, chopping up to use as an example, did have some colored paint on it. As you can see here too, we've got some photographs of cars and I can see we've got some red cars and green trees and even though it's a little bit faded, we know for sure that there's some colored paint over here. And even here on this um, cardboard, this cardboard is, um, you know, brown on one side but also is clearly colored as well. When it comes to the color, if you see that it's a glossy color, if you see it's one of those um, supermarket circulars where the, the printing has uh, got a real gloss and a sheen to it, that's not the type of stuff you really want to use in your worm bin. So you want to just put that into your recycling pile and send that off with the trash man when he comes to take away your recycling papers and cardboards. But if you've got paper that is just using black ink or any of this type of colored ink which is more or less matte in color and not shiny, then that's okay because as far as I know, all of the inks, including these colored inks, 
in the newspaper are um, utilizing a soy-based ink, which uh, is degradable and is okay for your worm bins. So some people say don't use color, but that's kind of a specific example where um, color is okay in, in a lot of cases, if not most cases. But you do often see, you know, circulars and other types of um, newspaper publications that do use a type of ink that you don't want to include in your worm bins. So that's just another note on the color when it comes to the, you know, colors that you might find on either the cardboard or the newspaper that you might be using in your bins. And eventually it really just comes down to preference and what you like to do. A lot of people I see use a great deal of just shredded newspaper because maybe that's what they have on hand in great abundance as the top covering in their bins. But since for me, what I have most readily available is uh, leaves, um, I like to cover up things in my bins with leaves. So uh, we're going to be covering up here on top with leaves. But before we do, it still seems realistic to include just a little bit of moisture to make sure that all this dry cardboard doesn't go in here completely dry. Because what it'll end up doing is it will wick up the existing moisture that's in the bin, but it might create an overall exceedingly dry environment, which you don't want to have. So if you're adding materials that have their own moisture, that's fine. But if you're adding materials that don't have their own moisture, it is always ideal to um, get them damp in some way as part of including them in your worm bin, worm bin build. And once we put this leafy material in on top as well, I'm going to give it one final dampening with my squirt bottle. And here again, it is completely personal preference, but I like my bins to have sort of a natural appearance to them when I open up the container. And that's my personal reason I prefer to use leaves as a covering. So to me, it's just an aesthetic thing, but completely optional. And whatever it is that you choose to use should be completely fine. And your worms will appreciate it. So I'm going to go ahead and spray this down a little bit more, just so we're not ending up with an exceedingly dry bin here. Okay, so I'm not quite sure what the capacity of this container here is, but it was full when we started, and I would have to say that I'm getting pretty low to the bottom because the, the pickup tube that the uh, spray nozzle gets the moisture off the bottom with is starting to cavitate, and I'm starting to um, get into sections of the bottle that no longer have water in them. I'm assuming the tube goes this direction because I'm only picking up air. I'm only squirting air at this point. So that really tells us We've gone ahead and we've used, you know, an entire bottle this size. I'm not quite sure what it is. It might be 12 ounces or so, just guessing. And I believe that that's probably a good amount to include along with this much material. And you can see that we've, at this point, taken the container up to the point where it's, uh, it's hard to say, but I would say that it's almost halfway full at this point. But don't forget, the majority of what we're seeing here is not really food and bedding and grit and moisture, it's air. So in time, as the worms start to work this down, this will definitely settle and become much less in terms of overall uh, volume, at least from a, the appearance perspective in the beginning here when it's uh, all fluffed up and taking up a lot of space. So this will eventually compress into much less over time. But in the beginning, it's gonna be great. It should be a, a, an environment that the worms should really, really appreciate. So this will lead us to the covering layers, because at this point, for a lot of people who actually have lids on their covers, and if you do have a container with a lid, one, one thing you want to be sure of, which I can't really demonstrate here, is that your lid itself either has holes in it, or some people that have lids with no holes actually punch holes all around the upper rim of their container, just to make sure there's always airflow, because if you end up locking the environment down and there's no airflow, your worms can suffocate, and you do not want to have that happen, trust me. So always keep in mind, depending on how you're going to be covering things up, airflow is important. So if you are one of those people who's using a container with a lid, make sure you've got holes. And how you end up putting those holes in is up to you. But since I don't have lids for my containers, um, I don't have to worry so much because I've always got um, a pretty good 
gap around the edge that allows for airflow to occur. So it really just depends on what kind of setup you have, but always make sure you take that airflow into consideration because it is important. So my personal preference for covering things up, as you might have heard me mention earlier, is to have the material in the bin right there on the top layer covered with just a sheet of paper. And in my case, it just happens that if I take a, a piece of this fairly small size newspaper here and cut it down the middle, it fits almost perfectly over the top covering the majority of the material. And then right on top of that, I'll put my plastic. So you saw me earlier demonstrating this could be bubble wrap, this could be whatever you have on hand. In my case, I'm just gonna be using this, uh, this piece of plastic here. And here you can see, I am pretty much out to the edge and there's very little space for the air to get by, but I do believe that this is still sufficient to allow for the airflow necessary to not make it into a dangerous place for the worms. But you do want to be careful because I guess there is always that potential if you've got like some moisture on the bin like I do here and the, the plastic bag does find itself tacking right up to the wall all the way around then you don't want to create what's known as an anaerobic environment which is absence of air. So you know always take care to you know either use something that comes a little bit shy of reaching all the way out to the edges or you know, maybe in this case, like what we're going to do here is we're just going to kind of crumble it up enough so that it doesn't really reach all the way out to the edges, allowing for airflow. And since we don't have worms in here quite yet anyway, it's not so important. But once you do have worms in your bin, it becomes extremely important. You don't want to have to, you know, throw away an entire container because you've just killed all your worms because they suffocated in your bin. That's just a, a word to the wise. So now the nice thing about having this plastic here, especially when you've just built the bin, is that you've got some materials in the bin that are fairly damp, other things that are kind of dry still, maybe they haven't soaked in any, any moisture, maybe they were underneath something that got the benefit of being sprayed and moistened but is still dry. When you've got this plastic on the top layer, you're actually creating sort of a terrarium effect. If you've ever had a terrarium, a terrarium is a closed environment that your plants grow in, and on a warm day, you'll notice that the evaporating moisture creates kind of a mist or a fog on the glass. Uh, and that'll eventually drip or drop back down into the material, helping the moisture in the container to continue recirculating. So I refer to this oftentimes as the terrarium effect. But basically, that just refers to whatever it is that you're using to help contain the moisture in your bin to not allow it to evaporate. And then someday your bin might just get to the point where you do find that it's a little bit too damp. And at that point, you'll have the option to remove the, um, the terrarium effect and allow, intentionally allow, the evaporation of moisture. But then you might still con continue to use perhaps a piece of paper, which will allow moisture to go through it, but not as much as if you just left it open to the air. But then again, that might be the um, situation you're in too, where maybe your material is so damp that you just needed to have direct access to the um, overhead air to allow for as much evaporation as possible. So at this point, I always like to uh, cover things up with a piece of cardboard. For me, it's almost just like a, a little bit of a weight just to keep things pressed down. And, uh, and like I said earlier, my worms often like to come up and um, take advantage of the moisture that collects on the plastic and drops right back down onto the paper right below. But just in case it's daytime and the sun is streaming into my wormery, this could become a little bit bright and intimidating for the worms. And I don't want the worms to feel intimidated. I want them to be able to come right up here and take advantage of that moisture if they want at any time of day, either day or night. Because even though I'm not running lights in my wormery, there is a window and the sun does come in. And if there was nothing covering this up, this would be exposed to the daylight and it might deter the worms from being here. So I don't want to have that happen. So I like to use this, if nothing else, then to serve as a cover so that it can remain dark for the worms. Alright, so I'm, I'm a day or two away from adding worms to this container, but I figured as long as I'm going to be uh, setting up a new bin here and I've got all the materials out here, why not turn the camera on and give everyone a quick demo of what I've got going on. So I've still got another bin to build. i got to get that vermi bag tote out here on the table and uh, repeat the whole process one more time. But you don't need to see this twice. I think you get the point. So I'll leave it at that. So before I go, let me just really quickly say thank you. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, as always, please remember to give me a thumbs up. That's always really appreciated. And also consider hitting the subscribe button down in the corner and hitting the bell too. This way you'll get notifications 
um, of any new content that's coming up on my channel. This way you won't miss anything. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye. Oh, what's this? You're still here? Oh, I thought you left already. Well, okay. As long as you're here, I'm in the process of building my new bin, or my second bin. This is my bag, actually. My vermi bag. And um, as long as I've got you here, let me just make a quick addendum to something I said earlier. Remember I said earlier that tearing the page of newspaper from top to bottom is the way to do it? Well, I guess in this case, since it is a smaller publication, it seems like they went ahead and they used the paper sideways. Because you can see this is where it comes off the roll, where it's cut with this um, this little ser serrated edge. But it does seem like in this particular case, with the smaller publication, the grain of the paper is um, rotated. So if you do try to tear down the page from top to bottom, as I recommended earlier, you're going to find that it's very difficult to maintain a straight line. So in the particular case of this slightly smaller size publication, this is in a local college's newspaper, I did try to tear it the other direction across the um, page and I found that that's the direction that the grain was in. And it makes complete sense since this is a slightly smaller than normal size newspaper. <laughs> but hey, as long as you're still here, I figured I'd throw that in here as a little bonus, bonus tip. So uh, just in case you ever try to tear some paper and get frustrated following my instructions, now you know. <laughs> Alright everyone, thanks again for watching. Have a great day. Bye now.